towards day 21. What believest thou concerning the Holy Catholic Church of Christ? The Son of God, from the beginning to the end of the world, gathers, defends, and preserves to himself, by his Spirit and Word, out of the whole human race, a church chosen to everlasting life, agreeing in true faith, and that I am, and forever shall remain, a living member thereof. What do you understand by the communion of saints? First, that all and everyone who believes, being members of Christ, are, in common, partakers of him and of all his riches and gifts. Secondly, that everyone must know it to be his duty, readily and cheerfully, to employ his gifts for the advantage and salvation of other members. What believest thou concerning the forgiveness of sins? That God, for the sake of Christ's satisfaction, will no more remember my sins, neither my corrupt nature, against which I have to struggle all my life long, but will graciously impute to me the righteousness of Christ, that I may never be condemned before the tribunal of God. Lord's Day 21 deals with three articles of the Apostles' Creed, the only Lord's Day to cover so many. And there is a reason for this. And the early church understood the reason and grouped these three together in its preaching and exposition of the Creed. And with the third edition of our Heidelberg Catechism, and ever since, question and answers 54, 55, and 56 of these three articles of the Apostles' Creed have been grouped together in one Lord's Day deliberately. The reason for this grouping in this Lord's Day is the intimate relationship between the three articles. The idea is that the person who believes and lives according to question and answer 58, conscious that the Son of God, from the beginning to the end of the world, gathers, preserves, and defends to himself a church by the Word and Spirit, a church out of the whole human race, elected to everlasting life, and the person who knows that I am and forever shall remain a living member thereof, is a person who enjoys the communion of the saints and who enjoys the forgiveness of sins. Or you could start with question and answer 55. If I, as a Christian, believe that I'm a member of Christ, and partake of all his riches, and therefore I know it to my duty, to be my duty, readily and cheerfully to employ my gifts for the advantage and salvation of the other members, then I will enjoy membership in a faithful church, if it's humanly possible for me to join one, but if it isn't humanly possible for some people, at least not currently, and I will enjoy the forgiveness of sins. Or, to start, with question and answer 56. If I know and enjoy the forgiveness of sins, that Christ's satisfaction was for me, and that he won't remember my sins or my corrupt nature against which I'm battling every day, but that he imputes to me Christ's righteousness so that I'm never going to be condemned before the tribunal of God, then I will seek out and join and be a living member of a faithful church manifesting three marks, if it's humanly possible to join one, and I will enjoy there the communion of the saints. And I say again, this is the common understanding of these three articles and their relationship amongst the early church fathers and our reformed fathers, and specifically the Heidelberg Catechism in this Lord's Day. Tonight we're going to hone in on the middle one of these three articles on, from the Apostles' Creed. 
creed, namely the one that deals with the communion of the saints. And if we ask, what sort of a communion is this communion of the saints? What does the Bible teach about the nature of this communion? The answer is, body communion. This is the teaching of the Word of God, especially in the New Testament. This is the theme of particularly one New Testament epistle, Ephesians, which deals with the church as the body of Christ. This is the subject of the 12th chapters of two other epistles, the first two epistles as they're arranged in our Bibles, Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. Church as a body. And of these two, Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, we're going to look especially at 1 Corinthians 12 because it's longer and more detailed in its treatment of the church as Christ's body, longer and more detailed than Romans 12, so it is the one that we read together earlier. Let's consider then the body communion hyphenated word with essentially one thought, the body communion of the saints. Understanding this bodily, this body communion of the saints, first of all with respect to oneself, and secondly with regard to others. The church of Corinth was a young church and a church with problems, many problems. More problems than any other church in the New Testament. I'm not saying its problems were the worst problems, because that wouldn't be true, but it is true to say that it had more problems. Its problems, the epistle itself makes clear, jeopardized the church's unity. <clears throat> there were factions in that church, as I'm sure you know. I am of Paul, said one group. I am of Cephas said another group, I am of Christ, said a third group. And you're not even to think that the third group had it right, but they too meant it in a sort of sectarian way. Chapter 2 indicates that there was in some a hankering after worldly wisdom, not the wisdom that is in Jesus Christ. So that some viewed themselves to be more sophisticated than the other, unsophisticated members. Chapter 3 refers to an amount of envying and strife among the saints. In chapter 5, as you will know, there was a case of incest in the church. Some people, the really enlightened and spiritual ones, were okay with it. But others rightly were appalled by it and opposed it. And so the apostle called for church discipline. <laughs> in chapter 6, we read of the edifying spectacle of some members of the church suing each other before the secular law courts, undoubtedly some in the congregation <coughs> sided with the ones who were being sued, and others would have said, we sympathize with the sewer because that person should have done that to you. In chapter 7, the Apostle answers questions regarding one's marital state. Some people are single. Some people are married. What do fathers do with their virgins, especially if the virgins grow older? What about widows? Chapter 8 addresses Christian liberty with some, claiming to be the stronger brother and others the weaker brother brother. In chapter 9, we read of the mundane issue of Paul's being supported financially. Paul refused financial support in Corinth. He didn't normally do that. He did it there for certain reasons. Others no doubt thought, we should be supporting that man. Whereas others argue, well, since Paul doesn't accept payment, for his work, 
he can't really be an apostle. So they doubted his credentials. In chapter 10, we read that there were some, apparently, who were dabbling with idolatry and then coming to the Lord's Supper. In chapter 11, there seems to have been some confusion between men's roles and women's roles in the church. And spiritual gifts raised a whole host of questions and jealousies according to chapters 12 and 14. That's quite a litany. I left out the problems in chapter 15. And you're entitled to ask at this point, what sort of a church is that? The response is, well, it's a young church. It's a struggling church. It's a church with many problems, but it is not an apostate, dead church. The reason is that the church of Corinth listened and yielded by God's grace to biblical correction. And this is a helpful truth because it doesn't in itself matter how many problems a church may have or for that matter how many problems a family may have or an individual may have. There is always a way back by God's grace, if the church, or family, or individual, is willing to repent and reform according to the word of God. If the scripture is given for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. You could even have a church, or an individual, or a family, having all sorts of problems, but there be some hope for them. But you could have a church, or an individual, or a family, with just one problem. And yet it would be far more serious and awful if the Word of God is rejected. And if the Word of God is rejected on many occasions, and over some period of time, then hardening sets in, in a church, or a family, or an individual. This church of Corinth, despite the many problems, problems impinging upon church unity, did not lose the three marks. It did not lose the mark of the preaching of the word because it hearkened to God's word to Paul in 1 Corinthians. It did not lose the mark of right sacramental oversight because it reformed its administration of the Lord's Supper according to Paul's instruction in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. It did not lose the mark of church discipline because in obedience to the apostolic injunction of chapter 5, it disciplined the man who committed incest and it listened to the admonitions throughout this inspired epistle. I should add at this point though that though the church was restored, didn't, this doesn't mean that Corinth was rectified suddenly or completely. If you read 2 Corinthians, you will see that there were some relapses and new problems surfaced. But the Corinthians, again, suffered the word of exhortation that is 2 Corinthians. But to return to the many problems addressed in 1 Corinthians, Itself, Paul understood these things impinge upon church unity. These things adversely affect the communion of the saints. These issues and the ripples from them contradict the truth that the church's unity is a very special organic sort of unity, that of a body. And that the communion of the saints is a very special sort of communion. The communion of a body. That's why he wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now I want briefly to follow the apostolic argument. The first three verses teach us that it is only by the Holy Spirit that one can truly confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Any ungodly person can utter those words without believing them. But truly, the Spirit of the Lord can work this confession in someone's heart. And the confession, of course, that Jesus is Lord is that He is Lord absolutely.
absolutely. That he is Lord of all things. That he is Lord of the church and everything in it. And that he is my Lord. That being established in the first three verses, the next three verses, four through six, say that in this church of those who confess Jesus Christ as Lord, there are many different spiritual gifts. Diversity. But the diversity comes from one spirit, verse 4, the one spirit of the one Lord, <coughs> verse 5, the one spirit of the one Lord who serves the one God, verse 6. Verses 7 through 11 explain and even list the different sorts of gifts given to the various members of the church. And it is carefully pointed out in verse 7 that these spiritual gifts are designed not primarily for the good of the person who has the gift, but for the good of the other people. Verse 7, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. And that word with all means all. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man, whatever the gift is, to profit all, to profit everybody. The person has it to help the other people in the church. And verse 11 states that these various gifts are sovereignly distributed by the Holy Spirit, quote, as He will, according to His determination and His good pleasure, He divides and distributes the gifts. Having stressed diversity in verses 4 through 6, and then 7 through 11, Verses 12 through 14 emphasize unity. And here, the idea of the body is underscored. The unity of the church is a unity of a body. And as I read verses 12 through 14, I want you to listen for the words one and body. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Five references to body in these three verses seven references to one, one body, one body. And with this as the background, we come to the first problem regarding the communion of the saints in the church. To simplify and put this problem in contemporary terms, you could say the problem involves an individual, a member who is not happy with his or her place in the church, a member who is not content in the way he thinks or she thinks, and after a while the discontent member voices his or her discontent. Verse 15, if the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the food shall say, speaking <coughs> about itself, a self-consciousness, I'm not the hand, I am not this. And then a faulty logic, I am not of the body. Verse 16 repeats, using a different body part, if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? To make this more concrete and personal to us here, we could talk about the various positions, official or unofficial, or the various 
various rules, more formal rules or more informal rules, in our own congregation. Everyone's familiar with the three offices in the church. The office of pastor, the office of deacon, and the office of elder. There are other rules, as some of you will be aware, the church, like any organization, really, as a treasurer, someone to look after the audiovisual, someone to look after the website, a webmaster, a caretaker, a greeter. There are people in the church who help with the building, <coughs> inside or outside, or both. There are those who lead and contribute in various ways in the men's Bible study and the ladies' Bible study and the classes on Tuesday or Wednesday. Mothers, especially mothers, bring children to the catechism, and the children, of course, contribute there too. And the ladies, usually, almost always, take care of the catering. With regard to aspects of evangelism, some have helped on stalls, given out leaflets, or inviting or bringing others to services. I hope I haven't left anything or anybody out. Uh, and it's important that the people who help out in every and all way always are thanked for that because they do a good work. But most importantly, the good news is the Lord rewards richly all who labor for him and for his word. Because sometimes, as you know, a person can have too low a view of him or herself in the church. And whereas we all should have a very low view of ourselves, and not just adopted for appearance's sake because of our sin, <coughs> there is a wrong way to have a low view of yourself that is essentially self-pity. And self-pity is one of the most dangerous and destructive ways in which to think. A person can almost literally destroy themselves with self-pity. It's a very hard thing to get out of once you get stuck in the mire. I can't do this. I can't do that. I have very few skills, or no skills. I'm not very useful, not very visible in the church. I'm not needed. If I wasn't there, nobody would miss me. And I am a total failure. I'm a total failure in the church. I'm a total failure in life. I'm just a total failure. And that's not true. It's not true. On the other hand, a person can have too high a view of himself or herself. People don't think enough of me, which being interpreted means I think I'm way up here, wrong, and I think that other people think I'm down here, you're probably wrong in that too, and I'm not comfortable with the gap. I deserve more recognition. I see other people getting recognition, I feel I'm not getting it. The danger with that is that once someone gets into that sort of a rut, there's never enough praise. It can never be happy. I only have this role in the church, and I should have a higher role. And historically, amongst the men, the greatest damage is done when a man reckons that he should be an elder, and the years pass and he's not nominated or he's not chosen. And he becomes convinced in himself that he should be an elder. Sometimes it goes so badly with that person, and happens in churches all over, that they get so annoyed that they will move heaven and earth if they could to manipulate others.
others and by hook or by crook see to it that they jolly well will be in heaven. Sometimes it results in people talking about all the things that they do and trying to line up other people to vote for them. Look at me how great I am. Sometimes it can cause so much problems in the church that eventually the discontent member puffs and leaves the church. If they won't make me an elder and by crook I'm jolly well bound to be an elder on that hood, well, stuff them and I'm off. I know it's petty, but that's what can happen. You've probably heard of instances where women got in a snit over flower arrangements or baking, so and so's cookies or cake was far better received than mine. Jealousy can get in, and you say, well, that's just pathetic. But, well, it is pathetic, but it happens, and probably more often than you think. And one of the most discouraging things for ministers when this sort of thing happens is they think, didn't those people ever listen to anything that was preached? Didn't they get a hold of the big things that were being taught? <coughs> that they were so fixed on some petty little thing like that, that became the be-all and end-all, and over something as small as that they left the church. But that can happen. Sometimes too, and it might seem strange, and perhaps it shouldn't feel strange, a person can have both the wrong views of himself or herself. On the one hand, one day, well, my view of myself is too low, I'm of no use, may as well pack it in. And then the next day, or even the next month, the view is too high, I should be an office bear. I can't believe that I haven't been picked a man with all my talents and ability. So one minute you think you're the worst in the church, the next minute you think you're the best in the church. And it just goes to show you that the devil enjoys tormenting people. And if you say, well, I don't come across much of this in my Christian life, I doubt if much of that really happens. Well, even the disciples themselves, even amongst the twelve, though not quite as petty, but amongst the twelve, this sort of thinking did occur. I'm referring here to Mark chapter 9. Jesus and the twelve were coming back to his house in Capernaum and he asked them, what was it you were arguing about on the way? And then nobody wanted to ask them because they knew fine well what they were arguing about. They disputed which one of them was going to be the greatest. So Jesus sat down and called the twelve to him and said, if anybody desires to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. And then he took a child, put the child in the midst of them, and took the child up in his arms. And that graphic example was, you and the church should be content like a child. And there's all sorts of things that make a child discontent, not having enough food or being tired, but forget about that sort of thing. The child is content just being a child. He doesn't want because he can't even think about such things. He's content with who he is, he's not interested in being the greatest, and that's the attitude for the people of God. First Corinthians chapter 12 explains where <coughs> on happiness with one's position in the church and amongst the communion of the saints, if it really takes hold, where it will lead. It will lead to one of two things. It will lead either to desperately seeking and wanting somebody else's place that's higher up or leaving the church. Verses 15 and 16 refer first of all to desperately wanting someone else's place. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body. And when the foot says, I am not the he means, I wish I was the hand. If I am not the hand, so I don't count, but I wish I was the hand. Verse 16, if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not the body. The ear is jealous of the eye and wishes that the ear was the eye. 
And the other option, a wrong view of one's place and role in the church and the communion of the saints, leads or uh, takes hold to leaving the church. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body. Think about that. Because I am not such and such, I am not of the body. Logically that doesn't follow. But if a person thinks, because I am not such and such, I am not of the body, and that takes hold, then the person will think, I don't belong in the church. I don't belong in the church because I don't have this position or role or because I'm not as esteemed as I would like to be. I am not of the body. Verse 16, if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body. You meditate on the idea that because I'm not this, I'm not of the body. Logically, you can't remain in the church. You won't. In our catechism, in its explanation of the communion of the saints, takes us off this wrong track. First of all, it takes us off the wrong track because it sets forth the truth of the communion of the saints, which leaves no room for self-pity. We have loads of room for repentance, loads of room for humility, but we shouldn't and we mustn't have room for self-pity because it's destructive. We all get into that at times and we need to get out of it. If the believer thinks to himself, well, I'm absolutely nothing. No, you're not. What do you understand by the communion of the saints? What does this mean to you? It means, first of all, that all and everyone who believes being members of Christ. I'm a member of Christ. I'm not nothing. I'm a sinner of myself, but I'm not nothing. I'm a member of Christ. If you say, well, poor me, well, the Catechism goes on to say that since I'm a member of Christ, I'm a partaker of him and of all his riches. Not for me, rich me. I'm rich. I partake of Christ and all his riches. I'm joined to him. I commune with him. No for me. If you're outside of Jesus Christ and you had a yearly income of $50 billion or pounds, then for you. Because it won't profit you one job if you gain the whole world to lose your soul. If you say, well, I don't really belong to the body. For me, well, do you think that Jesus Christ made a mistake with you? Because we're not our millions. We do not believe that we determine whether or not we would be in the body. We don't believe in free will. We believe in God's free will. And that God's free will towards us was sovereign grace. And God put me in the body. And if he put me in the body, I belong in the body. And I belong in the body so much that I will be in the body forever. I belong in the body so much that nothing and nobody can take me out of the body. And being in the body of Jesus Christ is who I am. That's my identity. He elected me before the foundation of the world, not only to be saved, but to be saved with such and such a place in the body. When Jesus Christ died for me on the cross, he died to wash away my sins and to fit me as a living stone in the temple or as a member in his body, I belong there. The Holy Spirit who called me through the gospel and who works in me to give me faith and to sanctify me, <coughs> puts me in the body, the specific place God has appointed to me. And if you say, well, I hear you, I hear you, but I don't think that applies to me. I'm too far along. The Catechism wisely begins after the question, what do you understand by the communion of the saints? It begins first that all and everyone who believes. All and everyone who believes. Everybody. Everybody who believes. All and everyone. Nobody excluded if they believe. <coughs> And that's the question. Do you believe? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? And if you answer yes to that question, then you must confess, and as a Reformed believer, we trust you do confess, that I understand that the communion of the saints, an article of the Apostles' Creed, being there for centuries, means that I, because I'm part of this all, and everyone who believes, that I'm a member of Jesus Christ. And if I'm a member of Christ, I'm a member of his body. I'm a member of Christ and I'm a partaker of him and I'm a partaker of 
all his riches and gifts. Which means, difficult as it is, because we all get this way at times, I need to start thinking not about how useless I am, but I need to start thinking about Jesus Christ and exercising faith and reading the Bible and appropriating it personally. Follow the logic of our Heidelberg Catechism, the very first question and answer says, I belong to my faithful Saviour Jesus Christ. And that means a lot of things. But in Lord's Day 21, question and answer 54, I belong to my faithful Saviour Jesus Christ means, necessarily and unavoidably, I belong to Christ's body in the church, and I am and forever shall remain a living member thereof. Of course. Because if you believe in Jesus, and Jesus is the head, then you become a member of Jesus Christ. And you can't be a member of Jesus Christ. It is impossible to be a member of Jesus Christ and not be a member of his body, the church. And if after all that, and I know it can be a struggle, you're still finding difficulty with this. And you say, well, people still don't think much of me. Well, Psalm 84 verse 10 says, a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. No disrespect to the reader or anything like that, but it's a relatively lowly position. But then the first should be last, so there's no need to worry. And even if, let's say, everybody in the church treated you like this, <coughs> then that's their sin. That's their sin. Follow the Lord, trust in Him, and He will work it all out. Secondly, we understand the communion of the saints to mean that everyone must know it to be his duty, readily and cheerfully, to employ his gifts for the advantage and salvation of other members. And if you say, therefore, well, I can't do much, I mean, a man like me, old, maybe not even brought up in the church, don't know much. I can't do much. I have few talents. Well, the very fact that you are saved means that you have some talents. Who can count your talents? Hard to know. God knows. That's enough. Everybody must know it to be his duty readily and cheerfully to employ his gifts for the advantage and salvation of other members. You cannot be saved without having gifts that you can employ for the good of other members. Attending the meetings, health permitting, encourages people, encourages me, I'm, I'm the lead man, I'm the minister. Even if you can't do that, and even if you're bedridden, you can pray for them. And everybody, as a Christian, sharing in the anointing of Jesus Christ and being a prophet and a priest and a king, has the spirit, has gifts, has abilities, and is able to do what they can. And, if you still can't think of much, use your imagination. Think a wee bit or ask a friend to help you think what you can do to help other people. On the one hand then, we can think too little of ourselves in a wrong way. On the other hand, we can be guilty of a sinful self Promotion. When we think about what we have in Jesus Christ, isn't that enough for us that we're partakers of Him and of all His riches and grace? You may think I don't have enough, I'm not esteemed enough, I don't have a position enough, but look what you have. Don't focus on what you haven't got. I mean, if you had the second best house in the world and you thought that what you didn't have, you could still make yourself more happy. Because there's a neighbor down the road, he's a better house than I have. Instead, the Christian is to focus 
not so much on himself, but by Christ, and instead to think of other people and their needs. My duty, my calling, no matter what anybody else is doing or not doing, my duty is readily and cheerfully to employ my gifts for the advantage and salvation of the other members. It's not about me getting something whereby my ego is rubbed. That's my calling. I've got certain gifts. I know I have. I might know as much as I would like. But I employ them cheerfully for the good of the other members. And I think about the mind of Jesus Christ, Philippians 2, so that I don't do things by strife or vain glory. I must, in lowliness of mind, esteem others better than myself. I must not look on my own things, but every man should think of the things of others. And I need the mind of Christ who humbled himself and had made himself of no reputation. What did they think of him? What did the church think of him? Admittedly, that was the church's fault. And it was the church's fault. And he went all the way to the cross. And the scripture also says, God has set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. And if we pause for a moment to think about our own physical bodies, and if we ask ourselves, when is a particular body part, any body part, when does it function best? When is my body part, whatever it be, happiest, so to speak, if a body part can be happy? The answer is that our parts of our human bodies are happiest, so to speak, and functioning best when they are doing what the head tells them to do. Right? My body parts, like my fingers, are happiest and functioning best when they're serving the other body parts. Your hands, you can comb your hair, you can wash, and so on. And this is the misery of neurological diseases. Because the head sends signals to one body part, and the body part can't do it. And that body part doesn't serve the other body parts. And it's very distressing too. And that's the way it is with us as believers, as members of Jesus Christ, and members of His church. We are happiest. We function best when we do what the head tells us to do. What Jesus Christ wills for us when we pray, when we exercise faith and repentance, when we live in our marriages and in our homes and in the church and work and the neighborhood according to His will. And we, as body parts, function best, help the other body parts to function the way they should, when we serve the other parts of the body. We're running out of time. I'll have to be quicker with the second point. If verses 15 through 20 deal with the wrong view of oneself as a member of Christ's church, verses 21 and following deal with the wrong view of the other members of the church. Another serious problem. Verse 21, And the eye cannot say unto the hand, the eye now isn't criticizing itself, but the eye is saying to another part of the body, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. So if someone in the church says, well, that person, he's poor. He lives in the wrong part of town. She has no sense of humor. That's a, you know, if I wasn't a believer, I would say that he's just a grumpy old soul. And I don't like the sports team that that person supports, and they're always going on their brother and the thing, whatever their team beats my team, and they're always going on with politics. I don't like his politics. I don't like that person's nationality, or their color, or their social class. I think their behavior is bizarre at times. I'm embarrassed by them, and the way they dress, and how they behave when visitors come in. And I really have no need for them. And really, I wish that they would just leave. And if I was so inclined, went down this line a bit further, I would engage in what's called in the business world a constructive 
dismissal, sort of make life hard for them, and sort of force them out the door. The person may think that he's doing God a favor in this way of reasoning because he may think, see that person over there? I know fine well that he or she is sinning grievously. But let's assume, for the sake of argument, that such was indeed the case. Let's assume that that person who you sinfully do not like in the church and would really kind of like to see leave, let's assume that that person is the greatest heretic ever. For the sake of argument. Let's assume that that person's life is so gross and sinful that really he ought to be serving, or she ought to be serving, a lifetime sentence in jail. Let's even say that you are pretty sure, or even 99.9% .9 sure, that that person is reprobate. Of course, we raise the question, how and why go out you could know this, but anyway, let's assume all those things are true. And that person is not only the biggest heretic, but the most sinful in his lifestyle, and you think the person is reprobate. Put the whole three together. That makes no essential difference to your calling. Your calling as a Christian is to pray for him or her, to love that person. And it's easy to love the people who are lovely. The hard thing is to love people when we rightly or typically wrongly find them unlovely. And we're to receive that person because as Christians, and especially as reformed Christians, we operate not on the basis of personal likes or dislikes, we operate on the basis of a credible profession of faith. If someone's a member in good standing, if they profess to believe the faith, and if they live a life consistent with it, and even if you don't <laughs> think they do those things, but you have no proof, that person is to be received, treated, and spoken about as a believer and a valuable member of the church. And if you say, well, it's not really credible, then your duty is, incredibly difficult, very few ever do it, your, your duty is to go the way of Matthew 18, humbly to come to the person and point out their sin. And if necessary, come back later after many visits with a witness or two. You must come with proper evidence. And even if you are right, and that person is the biggest sneaking sinner the world has ever seen, if you behave sinfully towards that person, your behavior only makes things worse. And the calling of the communion of saints is readily and cheerfully, those adverbs are difficult, readily and cheerfully to employ your gifts for the advantage and salvation of other members. That's question to answer 55, which is confessional and which is reformed. And then, and this applies to all of us, wherever we may be, we're to consider through it all our own calling, not even the perceived, real or imagined sins and faults of other people. We're to think about our own faith. Do we believe? that each and every one who believes is a member of Christ and is a partaker of him and all his riches and grace. Do we believe that? And do we exercise love so that we readily and cheerfully employ our gifts for the advantage and salvation of other members? And you will remember that 1 Corinthians 12 comes before 1 Corinthians 13. And 1 Corinthians 13 is linked to the preceding chapter, that after all this talk about the body and so forth, Paul says, yet I show unto you a more excellent way. And then he goes on to talk about the indispensable nature of charity or love in the first three verses of chapter 13. And then he says that this is what love is. Charity suffereth long, it puts up with a lot. You see that in your family. If charity didn't suffer long there, you'd be tempted to put some of them out at times. You do that too in the church. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Not jealous of someone else's success or clamoring to get his position. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly or inappropriately or rudely, seeketh not his own, 
is not easily provoked and thinketh or reckoneth or imputeth no evil because charity covers the multitude of sins. And we remember through all of this that it isn't you, it isn't me, who determines who is in the body. That's a divine prerogative. That's God's right. He elects. He atones for the blood of the Son. He grants irresistible grace because Jesus Christ is the sole head and king of the church. And one last thing, the believer approaches this whole subject marveling with the fact that he is in the church. What right do I have to be in the church? Never mind anybody else. And I'm in the church on the same basis as everybody else. Question and answer 56. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. God has forgotten them all. That's the same standing everybody else has. Question and answer 54. I am in the church because God chose me to everlasting life. He gathered and defended and preserved me into this body and in this body. And that's where we all stand. And that's the same calling that we all have. And may the Lord grant us his rich grace.